We live in what could well be called the totalitarian 20th century. For more than 50 years all over the civilized world, totalitarian governments ruling collectivist societies have been on a forward march, and limited governments protecting freedom in individualist societies have been in retreat. The advance of totalitarianism has not been smooth or always regular. It has met with local and temporary setbacks, but its ominous forward thrust has continued nevertheless. Historians of the future, looking back on our troubled time, are almost certainly going to mark this advance of totalitarianism as the most striking political fact of the 20th century. And they are going to be puzzled and bemused by all the frantic debates in which we engaged about the right and the left, the passion that we poured into denouncing one form of tyranny while extolling another. It is just not going to make much sense to them, and it doesn't make much sense now. The best that can be said for us is that we are too close to the trees to see the forest. But we have passed enough trees already so that the idea that there is a forest might reasonably have suggested itself to us. Modern tyrannies the world over take three basic forms, which are far more like one another than they are different. Those three forms are the communist, the socialist, and the fascist. All find their ultimate philosophical origin in the tortured collectivist thought of Karl Marx. Pseudo-intellectuals have created a folklore and a myth of left and right, which places communism at the left end of the political spectrum, fascism at the right end, and socialism just a bit to the left of center. The area to the right of the center in this mythology appears to be occupied by people who don't know what they believe or what kind of government they have or want. The most striking fact about this curious and utterly false picture of the modern world and modern political ideologies is that it has no place for freedom at all. And in their hostility to freedom, all collectivists agree. The fascist form of tyranny was discredited in most of the world as the result of the defeat of the Axis powers, Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan, in the Second World War. So it has proved convenient for anti-freedom propagandists to try to identify freedom with fascism. So stated, the idea is preposterous, because the two are obviously opposites. In order to make this linkage in the public mind, the left-right myth has been created. Fascism has been linked with the right, and freedom has been linked with the right. Thus, by implication, and increasingly by direct accusation, the two opposites can be joined together through the medium of that vague and essentially meaningless term, the right. Enough for the false picture, it is time to move on to the true one. The great antagonists in the 20th century world are not communism and socialism, or communism and fascism, or socialism and fascism, despite all the endless attempts to make them seem so. The Hitler-Stalin pact should have disproved this myth for all time, if nothing else did. The great antagonists are collectivism in all its forms and real individual freedom. The collectivist puts a nation, or a master race, or an economic class highest in his scale of values and the individual human being at the bottom of the scale. Thus the collectivist gives his loyalty to an abstract idea, a collective, something which does not actually exist. If you claim to be acting in the name of an individual or helping him, and he tells you your claim is false, that is likely at least to cramp your style. But if you claim to be acting in the name of a nation or a race or a class, and helping that nation or race or class, the alleged beneficiaries of your services cannot repudiate you. They have neither tongue nor voice for nations, races, and classes, except as convenient theoretical abstractions, do not exist. Only individuals exist. Collectivism in practice is the high road to power by some individuals over other individuals, power which is ultimately unlimited. It is thus tyranny in the classic sense, whether the rule is by one man or by a committee. Because tyranny, since the days of ancient Greece, has been a byword for unlimited power, unrestrained by any constitution or the actual wishes of individual citizens. Collectivist power is established and maintained by the initiation of force through government against individuals in a systematic manner on a massive scale. Its prime goal is not, as we have so often been told, control over the thought, speaking, and writing of men. It is control over the production of men over their earnings and the use of them. Control of thought and expression in totalitarian states is primarily a device to protect the collectivist rulers 
from exposure of the evils for which they are responsible. And the worst of their crimes are not committed against thinkers or speakers or writers, but against producers. Freedom, properly understood, thus means not only freedom of speech and the press, but freedom of production and trade. Any attempt to separate these freedoms and put them in watertight compartments is simply a modern application of the ancient maxim still deservedly popular with collectivists of all kinds, divide and conquer. With this as background, it is easy to see the nature of the real distinction in politics and government in the modern world, which has nothing to do with the artificial and largely mythical categories of left and right. That real distinction lies between those governments which claim and exercise essentially unlimited power over their productive citizens and those whose power is still to some degree restrained. Tragically, there is no government in the world today which comes close to confining itself to the only necessary and just purpose of government, the protection of the life, liberty, and property of its citizens. Those forms of tyranny, which we call communism, socialism, and fascism, past and present, have all agreed in claiming and exercising essentially unlimited power over their productive citizens. They have differed only in the means of control employed and in some of the propaganda used to justify that control. Communism, the oldest of the three forms of tyranny and the one closest to the original thinking of Karl Marx, has long seemed the most radical and dangerous because it involves outright confiscation and government ownership and operation of all the means of production except for small plots of farmland outside collective farms. But government ownership and operation of enterprises has proved highly inefficient in every country where it has been tried, including both Soviet Russia and Red China. And the drastic and obvious act of physically seizing all major means of production has hampered the collectivist drive for public sympathy and support. So today, even in Russia, there is less emphasis on centralized planning as the only permissible means of running an economy and talk of bringing back market criteria in determining production. Of course, the last thing the rulers in the Kremlin would ever consider is restoring real freedom to their people. But if they can give the illusion of a bit of freedom, they are likely to establish their rule more firmly. The economic control technique of socialism and fascism is virtually identical. Both leave legal title to most factories and other major centers of production in the hands of individuals. In recent years, one socialist party in Europe after another has dropped the old demand for nationalization of basic industries from its public platform. Thus, no alarming seizure of vast quantities of private property is necessary, and the government does not have to take the blame for inefficient operation of nationalized industries. Instead of confiscation, the government enforces its control through regulation. The network of regulations soon becomes so tight that, in effect, the bureaucrats who make the rules are giving orders to the men who still theoretically own the factories on exactly what to produce and how to produce it. The end result is for all practical purposes the same as if the government owned and operated the industry. But it looks different from the outside and people are fooled by the appearance. This is the way of life, production and government in the nations of Western Europe now ruled by socialist parties in name or in fact. It was the way of life, production and government in Nazi Germany fascist Italy, and Spain of the early days of the Franco regime. Mussolini, before for tactical reasons he began calling his ideas and program fascist, he invented the word, was a Moscow-trained communist. Few people today realize or remember that Nazi, the German abbreviation which Adolf Hitler chose as the name for his political party, stood for National Socialist in German. The only significant difference between the so-called democratic socialist technique of collectivist rule and that of the Nazis and fascists was in the kind of propaganda used to justify it. The socialists continued to use the classical Marxist line about the exploited classes, mixed with occasional democratic rhetoric, while the Nazis openly preached tyranny and racism. Though their means of exerting power within their homeland were clever and successful, Nazi propaganda was often crude and repellent which explains their failure to win the widespread sympathy and support which is given today in much of the world to socialist and even communist regimes. 
Though once they came to power, the Nazis openly condemned democracy as a form of government, the way they came to power is far too often ignored by those who exalt democracy as a sure safeguard against tyranny and tend to think Fabian socialism harmless because its advocates seek power through elections. Adolf Hitler, one of the bloodiest tyrants the world has ever known, came to power in a prosperous, peaceful, and highly civilized nation in a free election in 1933. He was voted into office by the German people. True, they never had a chance to vote him out again, but they could have learned in advance that that would happen simply by reading Hitler's own book, Mein Kampf. This example alone should show that just as the techniques of economic control, whether by nationalization of industries or simply by bureaucratic regulation, do not change the basic nature of collectivist tyranny, so the political techniques of gaining and keeping power do not change its nature either. It makes no difference to the enslaved citizen whether the tyrant who enslaves him was freely elected, like Hitler, or put in power by a revolutionary coup, like Lenin, or the victor in a civil war, like Mao Zedong. The fact of enslavement remains the same. We occupy ourselves endlessly today as we try to fathom what is happening in the world with debates as to whether this or that tyrant was properly elected, whether he is a communist or a Fabian socialist or a right-wing fascist, whether he will confiscate private property through physical seizure, the effects of rigid regulation or ruinous taxation. We are obsessed with the methodology of collectivism. Why should that matter to men who believe in freedom? It is the result that counts, and the result of collectivism is loss of freedom and the establishment of unlimited power, whether called communist, fascist, socialist, or democratic. Actually, the evidence indicates that the most successful form of tyranny in the modern world is neither communism nor fascism, but Fabian socialism, which by its gradualness and use of democratic forms dulls the conscience of men and allows them to sleep, hardly aware of the freedom they are losing. And there is reason to believe that an alliance of Fabian socialism with the enormous powers of the office of president presents the supreme threat to the future of individual liberty here in America. The advance of totalitarian government in the 20th century will only be halted if we oppose it not just on one or two fronts, but on all fronts, and if we resolutely and consistently choose freedom over collectivism in every form and guise.